Hello fellow self-hosters, Alex here. We've got a super exciting episode up our sleeves today. This is one I've been waiting to share with you for a little while. Uh, it's a pre-recorded interview with Elan, the CTO and co-founder of Plex. Chris and I got the chance to talk with Elan during the JB Sprint in August from his Hawaii home base. We cover lots of ground in this interview with him on topics ranging from electric cars to the motivations behind starting Plex in the first place and where the project is heading in the future. Be sure to stick around, though, as we have some exciting news about the Ghost blogging platform's new release to share as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy our interview with Elan Feingold from Plex. You guys know this, Alex and I are both big Plex users, and I challenged Alex before the show started to attempt an elevator pitch explanation of what Plex is. Okay, here we go. Plex organizes audio and visual media uh, from your personal media libraries and allows you to stream it to any playback device. And for me, Plex has been a huge gateway drug. I, uh, I had a Synology NAS back in the day, and now I have a, a huge server in my basement with 100 plus terabytes that has 20 cores and hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. And I honestly I owe an awful lot of that stuff to Plex. Um, one of the other cool things that Plex does is that it does on-the-fly media transcoding. And why that's important is lots of different media devices support different codecs. You know, a web browser might not be able to support the same codecs as an iPhone, for example, or an Android TV box. And the single most magical feature of Plex is that if I press play on a device, there's no configuration required. It will just start playing my media as if by magic and transcode it from whatever source using FFmpeg to whatever target device. It's, it just works and it's wonderful. That was pretty good. What do you think, Elan? I'm impressed. I, I, are you uh, looking for a position as our PR uh, spokesperson? <laughs> I love your accent. I love the way you can describe that. That's brilliant. Well, I, I got a, I got out of a speeding ticket with this accent a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> <laughs> now, now don't be sniping my co-host. I just got this thing off the ground. Damn it. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, we thought maybe we'd like to start with a few personal questions. Our our crowd is a lot of a do yourself hosted kind of group. And they love to know what people's setups are. And so we would like to ask, at what you consider to be home base, roughly how many computers would you say are in the home? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I work personally off a Mac desktop. Right now it's a Mac Mini. Um, I used to have the Trash Can Mac Pro, but that just got super long in the tooth. So I moved to, a, to one of the new Mac Minis. And then my wife and I both have MacBooks. Because I really love the, the fact that they're super light and portable. And I don't do a lot of coding on that, mostly on the desktop with a bigger screen. And then as far as the media box, um, I have a 3U Norco box with a bunch of hard drives in it, probably around 100 terabytes. Um, and that's running ZFS on top of Ubuntu which is sort of what most of us at Plex have gravitated towards. We really like ZFS or ZFS, if you will. Um, although there are several people that use on RAID, but I tend to use that um, ZFS. And the, <clears throat> it was an older um, system, but I just upgraded recently. I guess Facebook and a bunch of other companies dumped a bunch of Xenons on them like that they were using in data centers. So I picked up a couple of... Um, eight core 16 thread xenons for like 100 bucks each so now it's got a total of 16 cores 32 threads for 200 bucks which is kind of unbeatable nice no kidding now i kind of got to know with all of that kind of storage and stuff have you uh, invested in a pretty fast local network well yeah when we got the place we at, we wired it for cat 6 um but sadly i mean i so I, there's gigabit running to all the important places and I experimented probably about a year ago with trying to go 10 gig just between the Mac Mini, which, as you know, like its Ethernet port sports 10 gig. And so I added one of these cheap $100 cards to the Linux system that also supported 10 gig. And it kind of worked for like a few days. And I would transfer an MKV file back and forth and be like, oh, my God, 300 megabytes per second. That's incredible. And then it just like stopped working on the Linux side after a while. And I would get like wouldn't be able to connect and I'd have to reboot. And I just was like, okay, fine. I'd prefer stable one gig over unstable 10 gig. Right. Yeah. I mean, there must, you must've been around in a time where even one gigabit would be just a remarkable transfer rate. 
Oh yeah, incredible. I mean, the, the the thing that actually blows my mind nowadays is that with a good Wi-Fi connection, you can get up there in at least the hundreds of megabits per second. Like that is kind of mind blowing. Like I don't think Wired has actually really kept up um, with the accelerating speed of wireless. Thank goodness, because it probably makes Plex much more of a real option for people in homes that don't have you know um, physical wiring. It is true. I mean. Honestly, I think um, a, a technology that people don't give enough credit to is Powerline, which is also something that's progressed super fast. I had a thing in my living room that I wanted to also um, speed up with Wired, and I used Powerline, and I was able to get about a gigabit, I think, um, just over Powerline, which is, again, kind of crazy. That used to be super flaky. It used to, you know, 10 megabits, 5 megabits, but it, that's gotten really good, too. Speaking of power, I was doing a bit of research before the interview. How do you like your Tesla Model 3? That's some impressive. I'm like looking around for a spy cam now. Um, <laughs> uh, there was some post on Medium that I found. Yeah, um, I love it. It's, I, to me, it's like the future of cars. And I know that's a term that is thrown around fairly lightly. But I guess the, the feeling I have with it as it gets software updates and new features over the air is it you know like i feel like i'm living through the revolution on the way to self-driving cars and i'm not you know like as bullish at the the company is very bullish about full self-driving end of the year except for regulations and like you know historically that's always been a lot harder but it's incredibly cool to sort of live through in theory have the hardware and just need the software and see the software take incremental steps, you know, like, hey, all of a sudden it recognizes stop signs. Hey, all of a sudden it knows how to stop at a stop sign. Like that's, it's, as wow. a nerd geek kind of a guy, like that um, is an incredibly unique experience in a car, right? Usually you get a car, nothing gets updated ever. You sell it and get a new car, maybe you get an upgrade. Um, so it's, it's really, it feels like a living piece of technology essentially. Did you ever have an, an iPod back in the day? I remember that Apple had a similar kind of, you know, we, we're used to devices that never see updates. We never get new features. And I, I remember having that same kind of journey of discovery with my first iPod. I unfortunately came to iPod late. Um, instead, I had one of those creative Zune players, which was just utter crap. Oh, yeah. Like, no one had figured out back then that really all you needed to do was a simple hierarchy of artist album track. Like, no one had figured that out until Apple came along with the iPod and everyone was like, oh, yeah, artist album track. That makes total sense. Um, but, yeah, I know Apple's always been really good about updates. Talking of um, in user interfaces and stuff, uh, the iPod revolutionized things with a click wheel. I test drove a Model 3 a few weeks ago, which is why when I saw it, I brought it up because I just wanted to get another person's input into why I should buy one. How are you finding the zero buttons thing? You should definitely buy one. But um, so I counted, because I, before the Model 3, I had a Leaf. So I've been electric for a while. I had two successive Leaf, leaf leases, say that three times fast. And I counted the number of buttons on my Leaf and it was something ridiculous. Like, I'm not exaggerating here. I think it was something like, 60 or 70 buttons in that sort of front hemisphere compared to the Tesla, which was like 10 or something like that. But I have slightly mixed feelings. Most, for the most part, it works amazingly well. And, you know, the sort of the control surfaces that they do have with the um, D-pad things on your thumbs work super well for various aspects. Um, but I do, there, there are a couple things like opening garage doors, and if you have to make adjustments to things, looking, having to look at the screen and hit a tap target while you're driving at 50 or 60 miles an hour is unquestionably less safe than, you know, fi like feeling from a mechanical switch or knowing where it is. So that's a bit, um, I think that's, but that's essentially just an aspect of, again, the hardware is a little bit ahead of the software, right? Like eventually we probably won't need the wheel and eventually it'll be smart enough that I don't have to, you know, change the wiper speed. Um, so the hope is that the software will eventually catch up and just make it less and less likely for you to have to touch anything. Yeah, if, if you're not the one driving, I guess it doesn't matter so much. So anyway, let's shift gears a little bit and get into some of the backstory behind Plex. It's been around a little while now. Uh, I forget what year it was founded. I, I, like 
technically, I think we're coming up on the exact 10 year anniversary of the incorporation, but like we were around for a bit before that, before we were sort of a real company. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I'm wondering what, what motivated you to create Plex in the first place? I mean, uh, essentially the story is very simple. My wife left me alone near Christmas. I was bored and I was just wanted to play around with something. And uh oh, I had, yeah, it never turns out well. Um, I'd been running the Xbox Media Center on a hacked Xbox, and we were just at that cusp where you were starting to see 720p HD video up here. And it would, the Xbox was clearly struggling at this. And the Mac Mini was out, and that just seemed like an incredibly great form factor for, I mean, it was, you know, like a tenth of the size of a, one of those giant Xbox things um, and super good horsepower. So it just seemed like an obvious target. And the x C team had already been working on porting it to Linux. And as you know, like the underpinnings, Unix, same thing. I was like, eh, how hard could this possibly be? Let me give it a try. <laughs> Famous so last words. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't very, it wasn't very easy. But that's, that's how it all started, essentially, with scratching an itch, which is probably how most projects start. Yeah. Now, I guess the 10-year mark is kind of a good opportunity to, to look back. If you had a time machine, would you go back and uh, slip one bit of information to pass self to do something differently? I mean, there's, there's definitely things we've done along the road that I would have done differently. And, uh, but I don't, I don't know if there's any, if I can summarize it down to a single thing. Maybe like don't, don't DDoS yourself as much. Do you mean your servers or yourself personally? <laughs> Like our servers DDoSing our services because when you have a you know millions of machines out there and you're like okay let's flip on this new thing and they all start using it it's you can melt yourself down but uh, no I, I think it's there's definitely lots of lessons learned on, along the way and one thing that has always been super important to me as well as I know my co-founder and a lot of the other people at Plex is we really do try to stay in contact with the community. Like I've just been in the forums replying to posts and I, I love that contact with users. And I think that having that contact, keeping that um, surface area, the surface contact area between yourself and your user base helps you on the right track. Like they will tell you very vocally when you're doing something wrong. And again, you might not always agree and you might agree to disagree. Or you might take a slightly different turn or to quote, what I think is actually not a Steve Jobs quote, like you might give your customers what they want, not what they ask for. But in general, I think you ignore your customers and you lose that surface contact area with your customers at your own risk. Like that's the, I think one of the biggest lessons. It's a tight line because there's also the enthusiast trap where you get stuck always trying to serve your most vocal, most diehard fans and it's harder to appeal to a wider audience. That is entirely true. And I, I note that uh, it, I've watched Plex over the years expand into new integrations with podcasts and other online services. Have you seen pushback from the original diehard Plex community on those new services? How's that been? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think <laughs> we used a joke like, it, you know, if we'd release an iOS update, the Android people would get angry. If we'd release an Android update, the iOS people would get angry. So I think Plex... One of the metaphors that we use internally to describe it is it's essentially a fractal, right? You can zoom in and it, maybe you're interested in Plex for music. So you're very zoomed into that part of our platform. Maybe you use Plex for movies and you're very zoomed into that. And in a sense, like you're protective of the area that you are the most interested in, most, most vested in. And of course, that goes for app, you know, what app you use, what streaming device you use or don't use. Um, and I think there's also kind of just a sense of uh, cheese being moved. You know, people are used to things a certain way. Um, our intent with, with podcasts, you know, for example, was to give people the opportunity to consume this content alongside their other content and maybe even relate it in a way so that, hey, if you like have Bob Dylan in your library, you know, like, and you have Plex everywhere, why not? Why shouldn't we say, hey, there's a really good podcast that where they're interviewing Bob Dylan. So if you like Bob Dylan, you have Bob Dylan in your library. Maybe you want to check out this podcast, um, and we thought that would be super cool. And you know, people would people would like that sort of integration. Um, we we haven't gotten along to that specifically yet, 
But that's along the lines of you know where we're thinking. You can see it with title. Um, there's been also pushback against title. Some people don't like it, but I think the people that have music libraries that want to expand their musical horizons, to me, and that's count, I count myself in that. To me, like I think the title integration is awesome. I have purchased more new music in the last year than I have in the previous five years because it's such a cool way to discover new music. I mean, we, we um, I know there's some detail here, but like we show you new album releases from artists that are in your um, library and we let you play radios where we introduce new stuff that you haven't heard from Tidal. Um, so there's all these kind of cool little integration features. So I think if you kind of zoom out and you're like, why is Flex doing Tidal? It might seem kind of weird, but if you are actually invested into the music ecosystem and you're a music lover, I think you'll find it's there's there's no other solution that that melds the two so seamlessly. I like seeing it as a podcaster. I like seeing those podcasts in there. And I noticed recently they they seem to be matching more to what my movie library has. And I think that's a pretty clever strategy too. So I, I say as a podcaster, keep it up. <laughs> but it's a bit self serving. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it, you know, it's a big, it's a giant web of media, right? Like, it's, uh, these things are, are very interrelated. There's podcasts that relate to movies, there's podcasts that relate to TV shows, there's, um, there's all sorts of relationships between different types of media. And it's nice to have fresh content without me having to do the work sometimes. Exactly. And that's, that's honestly, you know, that's, that's one of the other things that we like about it is, you know, the barrier to entry to Plex historically has been, hey, go get a server, hey, go rip a bunch of CDs or DVDs or whatever. That's hard, right? You need a computer that's always on. It's clearly not for everyone. But with a podcast, you don't need a server. Um, so that you know, makes it, hopefully lowers the barrier to entry. So that's, uh, that's also a good thing. So I wanted to take a minute to just uh, walk back a little bit. Um, the feedback uh, from, the, from the users, I think sometimes the subreddit in particular can be a little bit toxic. I noticed one of your posts earlier had, yeah, I've, I've turned off notifications for obvious reasons. <laughs> I can only imagine how many times you get tagged a day just on Reddit. But there was one piece of feedback one of the users put, which I just wanted to get your uh, response to, really, which is most annoying to me is the fact that many bugs have gotten worse or have been unacknowledged. Yet Plex does nothing but introduce new features that I think the majority of users don't care about. I would rather no new features and a stable app instead of this feature I don't, uh, waterfall. Uh, that seems pretty harsh to me, having you know been a, a diehard Plex user myself for at least, I don't know, must be five plus years at this point. I've seen a few bugs and a few issues, but honestly, I don't see anything that makes me feel as strongly as this guy does. I just wanted to get your take on, on that kind of, uh, we would rather a stable app than no new features. I mean, I think generally building products, building software specifically, there's always a trade-off between new features and bugs. Software is never bug-free. There's always going to be bugs. And, you know, marketing, and there's always a push for new features. So there's, there's always going to be a trade-off there. Um, but I think the, the trade-off that we make, we definitely, it's not like all of our engineers are working on new features. It's not like all of our engineers are working on fixing bugs. There's always a a ratio of some doing new work, some doing bug work. So it's um, it's just it's it's tricky because there are certainly bugs that have gone unaddressed for longer than I would personally like. There are definitely um, you know times when I wish we were faster at fixing bugs, but it's always the trade off and. Um, you know, we, we definitely do try to address bugs. I think one of the things that, that the user is referencing and, and one of the things I've seen met, mentioned elsewhere is they would love it if we at least acknowledged bugs. And that's something that, again, we've tried to be better at. We try to respond in the forums. I've encouraged our engineers to, you know, spend more time in there and our support staff to say, hey, this, we're working on this. Yep, known issue. Yep, we're working on it. But we're sort of outnumbered. And there's clearly times when we don't, um, we aren't able to acknowledge every single thing. And it's, there's a lot of balls in the air. Well, as a user, I must say, I've noticed over the last nine months or so, 
that things have gotten significantly better on the messaging front. Um, the stability of the apps appears to have improved quite a bit. And uh, the only thing that I've noticed that's changed quite a lot has been the UI. Uh, there's been quite a few different revisions of the UI this year. And I wondered, given you just rolled out a new version a couple of weeks ago, is this the final revision we're going to see for a while? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a perfect example, I think, of um, the feedback loop and listening to users because we were heading down, I think, time flies when you're having fun. But last year, we were heading a, a, a particular direction with the UI and we got feedback on it. Um, and it, it really kind of missed the mark for what we were intending. And so we went back to the drawing board and uh, that's w when we came up with the Uno, the UI that we've termed called Uno. And the response to that has been overwhelmingly positive. And so th what you've seen over the last few months is essentially just a coalescing um, of all of our interfaces to go in that direction, because it seems to be one that our, our users like and appreciate the customizability of the home screen and um, all, that, all that kind of stuff. So essentially what you're seeing is just us converging on this. We feel that this UI will last us for a while. Like it's fairly scalable, right? It works in multiple different scenarios from all I want to see on my home screen is podcast and title to, hey, I have libraries from five different servers I want to have on my home screen and treat just as importantly. So, I think it's the best UI I've ever seen rolled out from the project. And I can only imagine the the incredible constraints that there must be in designing for all of the different types of set-top TV appliance boxes from, from Apple TV down to the sticks of all different kinds and random Android devices. It must be a pretty large part of the business. Yeah, and, and definitely, I mean, as as the tech guy, I really um, like it when we can reuse code as much as possible all over the place. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there's there's a wide variety of, of platforms that we hit. The, the Shield is a very powerful Android platform. There are way less powerful Android platforms. There's the smart TVs that like have very... We call them potato devices sometimes just because they're they're not super fast. <laughs> That's pretty good. Do you mind if I uh, mind if I borrow that? That's a good call. <laughs> no, and, and in fact, just as I said it, I'm like, I wonder why potato? Like spud gun, like potato. I guess potatoes are slow, but no, no vegetables move, so I don't know why we're singling out a potato. There's always that science experiment from like uh, elementary school where somebody powers something with a potato, so it's like just enough power. Ah, thank you. That makes perfect sense now. Yeah, that's MacGyver. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can only imagine the constraints just in shipping that software to on time to end users. We're having to go through different vendors and different app stores and all of that must be massively complex. Yeah. It's very hard. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely a, not, a, not an insignificant fraction of time spent on the packaging and different release formats and processes and all of that for sure. I'm just still thinking about the 10-year mark. Uh, it's pretty significant to be joining us right around then. And um, I'd kind of like to know about some future plans. There must be some stuff in the pipeline near term. Anything that you can share yet? Uh, one of the things that's near and dear to my own heart is the, the big upgrade of the music library. Um, as you may be aware of, we've been moving metadata sources um, and we've kind of revamped and upgraded the, the music system and a bunch of our associated systems in the cloud. And we think it's really awesome. Um, so we continue to make, you know, huge advances in um, the personal media space for that um, media type. And we're also looking to do some other cool stuff with movies and TV shows that you're going to see here shortly. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of like the trinity of investments. You know, we, we definitely are... Um, working on making the, the personal media features even more interesting. Um, and we're continue to look to make the players, the, the player space um, for us. Like you kind of mentioned at the beginning, you said very nicely about how you can play anything anywhere. And that's kind of been our mantra for a while. But we've been investing kind of behind the scenes and it might not be completely visible, but in the actual player stacks of our platform. So Android TV a couple of years ago got the XO player based thing, which is an FFmpeg based player. And then on Apple TV and iOS, we got the MPV based player, which again, this sounds like gobbledygook, which is probably why it's sort of 
hidden, but essentially we've... No, it, our audience understands, and boy, do we appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I love your audience. And yeah, so, I mean, that's that's been a key for us because we, we want the media to play well. We want the media to play fast. We want it to, you know, the more you can direct play, the more energy efficient it is, the faster you can seek, the faster playback time you have. So we've, we've really been investing heavily in that core tech of player upgrades and we take it very seriously. And um, so that's sort of like another part, right? Because in our platform, playback is an incredibly huge part. Um, and then on the third, third part is kind of where you've seen us play with podcasts and title and stuff like that, which is we happen to think that it's really cool to have access to an even larger catalog of content, some of which might not come from your own computer. Um, and we certainly don't want to force it on people. People can turn it off if they don't want it, but, um, we, we, we think it's, there's some really exciting opportunities for remixing your own content, uh, augmenting, we call it internally. Augmentation is kind of what, what the term we use. Um, and that's kind of what you're seeing with title. And I'll just give another example. Like if I go into Bob Dylan and I'm got my title account set up. If I have missing albums, if I'm missing any albums by Bob Dylan, they'll show up right alongside the albums that I own, one click to play them. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some, of the, some of the innovation space we're playing in. Yeah, that's really nice. And it augments, you know, cloud services like Spotify quite nicely to have something like that available in high quality and everything. Um, I wanted to touch... Uh, on the playback improvements that you talked about. Um, this this is a feature feature request from me, really. Uh, I have a server that has about 10 or 12 people that use it regularly. And one thing I've noticed, I have gigabit upload here, so I'm not constrained with my pipe going out. I would love to be able to set an on-the-fly transcoding um, preference, like prefer direct play over transcode or something like that, in instead of the current default. A server side? Yeah, server side, yeah. Like push it out to the clients. I mean, I, I guess uh, wouldn't that, I mean, that would assume that your clients have the downstream bandwidth, right? Like there might be, let's say if someone has a, a five megabit download, they're not going to be able to direct play a 20 megabit. That's true. I would prefer to be able to push a direct play i take your point though i mean you're trying to um aim at the you know the lowest common denominator which is going to be probably the client's downlink bandwidth or my upload bandwidth which i can control right now or heaven forbid somebody on mobile <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i was gonna say like if someone's on an iphone they probably don't have 20 megabits either i mean you, what you've touched on there is is some of the complexity that we were trying to um, or that we have been trying to address with the streaming brain project that we have, where the, the server is trying to be very cognizant of all of those facts. How much upload bandwidth do I have? What's the um, bandwidth of file? How loaded is the CPU right now? How much bandwidth does, is the client, uh, you know, how fast is the client able to transfer and sort of magically making adjustments. So, there, you know, you'll see um, cases where, one, if you have, let, let's say, 20 megabit upstream, you'll start with a transcode and you'll use up 15 megabits. And then when a new client comes on, like literally they would only have five megabits left. But what we do is we downshift so they can share more evenly the bandwidth. So there, there is a lot of magic going on behind the scenes right now to try to make it automatic. But that magic is essentially in, in the transcode, right? Because that's where you have the, the volume knob, essentially. You know, direct play, there's, there's no real volume knob on that. I actually am very impressed by how how intelligent the entire back end is. So this this kind of collection of tools is called the streaming brain, did you say? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure why we decided to call it that, but that just was kind of what we ended up calling it internally, the streaming brain. And, and amusing side note, um, when we have meetings around it, there was one guy who, um, one of our project manager guys who loved to use emoji, and he was trying to come up with emoji representation of streaming brain, and the best thing he could do is while well, streaming he used the shower emoji and then brain he used the robot so it was like robot in a shower and if you go to our online store i think we actually sell a t-shirt that's a robot taking a shower yeah it's like the robot from um oh what was that old sci-fi movie with uh hitchhiker's guide no no the one with leslie nielsen in it the uh 
Oh, it's such a, it's a classic. I can't believe I'm blanking on it. It's even in, it's it's in my Plex library. So I really I really should know. Forbidden Planet. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. I'll put a link to the blog post that, that has a picture of it. It's so good. We'll have that in the show notes. Yeah, our, that's our illustrator Craig. He is a brilliant, super talented guy, and uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of his work on our t-shirts. That's awesome. We always joke about pivoting to you know clothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm saying, if it all looked like that, that actually would be a, a, probably a lucrative side business, a little plex side hustle. Move over threadless. Yeah. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I hope we get an opportunity to chat with him in the future and just sort of check in on things. But you did promise we'd talk about Ghost. Ghost is a blogging platform that has exploded over the last few years. Last week, 4,286 new sites were made with Ghost. And that's just last week. And they have a brand new release. I ain't afraid of no Ghost. <laughs> I can't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it had to be done. It's what, one week away from Halloween. You've got to embrace my new country. That's right. Good for you. Yeah, okay, fair enough. We are talking about Ghost near Halloween, and somebody had to put it in there. Yeah. So you're a big fan, though. Um, I have daydreamed about using Ghost, but never had enough reason to move off of WordPress, another favorite of, uh, you know, the open source community. But you, you did. You just says, nah, no WordPress for me. Well, it was when um, Linux Server was in the early days, and I was doing a lot of blogging over there. And it's just, I don't know, like... WordPress is fine, but I always felt like it was an extremely big, heavyweight application for what I wanted to achieve, which was just write some text with a couple of images and a couple of categories and tags and that kind of thing. I don't need any of the CMS. I don't need any of the e-commerce type stuff. And Ghost fitted that bill really, really well. It had a beautiful typography because fonts do matter. <laughs> and the, uh, the writer's interface as well is super clean. So what do you consider notable about the new, what is it, 3.0 release they just announced? There's a few things. So firstly is they are looking to give creators a way to receive money without relying on a third party middleman like Patreon or something like that. And what's particularly interesting about this is it doesn't require the ghost company to remain in business either. So there is a direct way for readers of a blog to contribute to the writer of a blog, which is really nice. The payments all go through Stripe. So, so long as Stripe stay in business, then this mechanism will continue to work just fine. There's another new feature in the release, which changes the way in which the sites are generated. And there's a lot more support now for static site generation frameworks for things like Gatsby, Next.js, et cetera, et cetera. There's dozens of, dozens of changes there around that stuff. And if you want proof of the pudding, the entire ghost.org website is actually a Gatsby JS app hosted on top of Ghost. The other change that I'm super excited about is the way in which themes used to be developed. So before this release, you had to upload themes as a zip file, apply the change, and then pray that it worked. Well, now with a combination of the Jamstack work that they have, you can actually combine that with GitHub Actions and then sync custom Ghost themes to your live production site with each commit you make to Git. All right, I might give that a go in the future. You've tempted me, Alex. And so if you do, it's really easy to get started with a Docker Compose file. You can then couple that with an Nginx image from the Linux server guys and have a Let's Encrypt TLS HTTPS encrypted website. Um, we'll put a link to a sample Docker Compose and Nginx config file in the show notes for you. Ah, oh, you're a gentleman. Well, just a quick project off-grid update from me. I've ordered my cameras. I'll reveal which cameras here in the near future. And I can tell you and I are going to need to have a storage chat soon. we got to talk some storage. i gotta, I got to sort my storage out. That sends shivers down my spine, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about storage, Alex. <laughs> Head over to selfhosted.show to send us your feedback, comments, any other stuff that you think we should know about in this space. How I could do storage for multiple Raspberry Pis in a tiny network with low power requirements. I'd love to know that. self hosted show slash contact. I am at Chris LAS on the Twitter. He's at Ironic Badger. Thanks for listening. That was self hosted show slash four. Mm -hmm.